Let us stand up and pray together. Heavenly Father, with all our hearts we thank you for this absolute clarity that you have given us. Lord, we may say it in humility, so clear as you revealed your word and your will, yes, all of your plan of salvation in this time, it never was. Lord, you are faithful, you are true, you have done great things on us. Beloved Lord, also this afternoon we expect that you are present and we believe it, for you promised it and what you promise you keep for sure. We place this meeting very consciously under the coverage of the blood of the Lamb of God, very consciously under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Give grace to speak and grace to hear and grace to experience the heard word that we under the preaching of the word experience that what is preached Lord wherever your gospel is preached the things shall happen that are reported in the Gospels. For you are the same yesterday, today and forever. We thank you already now with all our heart for the victory and for the blessing that you will give us in Jesus' holy name. Hallelujah. Amen. We have heard the first sermon of the year 1988 just now and we notice on what the Holy Spirit puts the finger on. When we amongst us brothers prayed in the room here I felt from the prayer that Brother Rus is mightily moved and I have enough knowledge to know that one may not quench the Spirit of God. Although it sometimes seems to be hard, it is the plain truth. It is the plain truth. And whoever was last Sunday in Zurich can confirm that I said there, I am longing for that day where people receive the Spirit of God as at the beginning and really are sealed. For I not only want to have preached, I want with these people who heard the word from my mouth, I want to spend eternity with them. And for this it belongs that we make all the experiences that as conditions for the rapture, as requirements for the rapture are demanded in the Word of God. 
We have been also talking about this as brothers for some time. And we really marveled how it comes that so few experienced the true baptism in the Spirit. And when Brother Rus says here very sharp that from now on he will baptize no one anymore of whom he doesn't know that he made an experience with God. So I must say that the same thought accompanies me already since many years. One has to, as a man who baptizes others, one has to know that the person to be baptized has become a believer, that he has become a Bible believer, that he not only joins a church or obeys the word, but that he made an experience with the Lord. I believe that a contrition is given to every person according to the scripture from Romans know that the Spirit of God leads you to repentance. The Spirit of God who during the proclamation of the gospel is present, convicts of three things. And I would like to read these three things and then we can examine ourselves whether the Spirit of God worked in us and is still working. And then we come back to that what was already touched upon. John chapter 14, Gospel of John chapter 14. I most certainly am not prepared for this matter now at all. It comes surprisingly for me. And yet, the word is still written. No, in this case, it is chapter 16. Gospel of John, chapter 16. Here I would like to read from verse 7. Let us stand up for it, if I may ask for it. John, chapter 16, from verse 7, maybe from verse 6. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now listen closely now. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. This is the first. He will reprove the world of sin. Secondly, and of righteousness. And thirdly, of judgment. And for what I am even more thankful is that these three things in the next verse are explained. The next two verses or in the next three verses they are explained. Let's keep in mind 
and he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged Amen You may be seated We have at this place from the very beginning we had the instruction from God to everything what is preached to put it upon the biblical foundation. In fact everything here apply no opinions even they are very old or good here applies only God's word. Now I would like that you with your hand upon your heart answer these three questions to the Lord. Has the Spirit of God you precious sister and dear brother could the Spirit open your eyes? Could He show you what unbelief is and what the consequences were? And that it led to the first transgression in the Garden of Eden. It was unbelief toward the Word and unbelief led to disobedience and disobedience led to the fall. And the fall was perfect. Here it says, The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Can you document that day in your life on which you became aware that you are in unbelief and that you are lost in unbelief and that your eyes were opened according to the word of our Lord if you don't believe that I am he then you will die in your sin. But do you know of a day on which by the Spirit it was transfigured to you that it is He and that you came to the faith in Him as your personal Savior? Then just say, Amen. Amen. This must be, and it is particularly difficult for children who grow up in houses of believing parents. They have it particularly difficult. They are protected, they are kept from many things, and then it's sometimes difficult to draw a clear line. This I admit openly and I submit to that what is right and what was said. Also children of believing parents, they must, as their parents, when they were believers, they must experience God in the same way. And here we remember the statement of Brother Brenham that he took over from David to Plessis, that God has no grandchildren, but only children. According to the scripture, here am I and the children whom God has given me. It's even written in Hebrews. You all know the New Testament very well, 
and the old most certainly also a bit. We read on of judgment, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Maybe we left out righteousness, verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. What happened? Divine justification was given by the crucifixion and the resurrection. God has given back to man his righteousness. And now Christ ascended to as high priest, as high priest, because of his own blood that he shed to intercede for us. But I would like, especially about the one point, in no way I want to bypass this, that was also emphasized. I believe in a conversion with tears in a turning to God with all the heart, with a cry in the soul. That's how I experienced it. But of course it can also be that people experience God in different ways. Therefore, it is advisable that no one tells his experience of conversion in all the details so that others don't mean that all this must happen now with me also and if not, then I'm not a believer. We see even in the Holy Scripture sometimes people first became believers and then they were baptized and then they were baptized in the Spirit. And then it happened, while Peter was still preaching, that the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard his speech. And there was not much time for them to do this or the other. But the Spirit of God came upon them and convicted them they were converted, they were born again and spirit baptized in 10 minutes. You can read the sermon. Whoever can read well can read it in 5 minutes. When the Spirit of God really is present and we respond to the working of the Spirit, then we don't need 100 years maybe not even three hours, then it can happen in a few minutes. But I personally like to remember the times when we truly, until one, two or three o'clock at night, we were in prayer until we experienced God. There were really times where one didn't look on the watch, but waiting for the Lord. And when he didn't answer, one could not get up. One couldn't walk away empty-handed. And I wished that the Spirit of grace and supplication would be poured upon us as he will be poured out upon Israel according to the prophet Zechariah when they will look upon him whom they have pierced when we look on him who was pierced for us and when we know what he took upon him, then the Spirit of grace, 
of repentance. Yes, then the Spirit of God shall come upon us. And it says, they will weep bitterly and mourn as one mourns and weeps over the firstborn. Christ, the firstborn, died on the cross for you. And this strikes our hearts. This touches us. And I think this is it, what we need. Then everything becomes different. I still come to the third point. In case the second is completely clear of righteousness. God has given back to man through Christ the full justification and the divine righteousness. Our righteousness is like a filthy rag. But God's righteousness that we received through Christ is the righteousness of saints. I will read it to you from Revelation, probably in chapter 19. As I already said, I am not prepared for it at all. Somewhere it must be written here. Revelation chapter 19 and remember here the bride is described at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I read from verse 6 and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his bride has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Amen. This multitude in heaven, the bride of the Lamb, received God's righteousness. She was arrayed in it. Many wonder what the wedding garment is. Here you have it. God's righteousness, depending on the translation, righteous deeds of the saints, O oh, God's righteousness, but here we have it. The multitude dressed in white was convicted by the Spirit of God of the sin of unbelief, convicted of righteousness and of judgment. And what is the judgment? Let us read it in the Gospel of John, in chapter 16. Here it is written, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Amen. There are believers who always speak of that they want or have to deal with the devil. I do not belong to them. 
I belong to those who believe that Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, has come and crushed the head of the serpent. I belong to them. As Brother Brenham said it yesterday, praise be to God for it. He said, the brazen serpent represents the judged sin. Do you see how deep the Spirit of God went here? God has opened our eyes for it. Also about judgment, that the prince of this world is judged and that Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, as the victor of Calvary, came forth. These are things which move and touch us on our most insight. I also don't belong to them who want to correct something here from the front. But I belong to them who read the Holy Scripture, if possible, in context, in order to know who was addressed. One has to, while reading the Holy Scripture, one always have to pay attention who was addressed. This is very important. Whoever reads the Holy Scripture without being aware of to whom the Lord speaks here, he will take his head sometimes into both hands and be desperate and lose hope. But he who knows to whom the Lord said what, or also John, for instance, then we are helped because there were such whom the Lord called unto himself with the words, Come unto me all ye who labor and are heavy laden. I will quicken you. I will give you rest for your souls. And then you can read Matthew 23 how he rebukes the scribes, really, from head to toe, and says, Woe unto you, ye hypocrites! And then comes the whole register, one after the other. And when he turned to the multitude, then he felt sorry for the people. Let us distinguish, while reading the Holy Scripture, of what it is about, who was addressed, I read it to you. For also about this, the Lord himself gave testimony. In Luke chapter 7, here, our beloved Lord bore witness of the ministry of John the Baptist and he made very clear what has happened there. I read from Luke 7, from verse 26. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. And listen closely now. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. 
And in the next verse, we read the explanation of that, what we heard already. Verse 29 and 30, you can underline bold. And all the people that heard him, even the publicans, justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Did you see what is about here? There were two different groups. I read it to you, so that you know it once for all. Once again, I thank God for this Bible. Thanks be to God for the Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God that He speaks to us through His Word. I'm convinced God wants to start properly with us at the beginning of this year. He wants to lead us to repentance by His Spirit. And He wants that we bring forth fruits meet for repentance, not just pretending that we repented, but that there are really fruits meet for repentance. Let us read here in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 3. This I probably indicated already. For here it's also written, from verse 2, but I read from verse 10. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that has two coats, let him give to him that has none, and so forth. You all know the scripture. All the publicans, the sinners, the harlots, and who they were, the ordinary people came and all asked, What shall we do? The same was on the day of Pentecost. The question was, What must we do? What shall we do? He who did not ask, who was it? These were the scribes and the Pharisees. They had no question. They stood over everything. They were not addressed. Beloved, I believe that we come to this place not to criticize, but to submit under the word of God. And that each one who hears a sermon, a biblical proclamation, shall ask himself, Lord, what do you want me to do? You can believe me, if you have so much confidence and faith. I say this sentence, sometimes, on one day, a couple of times. I say, Lord, show me what I shall do. Let me make the decisions which you made for me. This is not just a one-time thing in the life of a man who starts the way with God. This goes with us throughout our whole life. May I ask you, when our Savior has said, Not my, but thy will be done. Was it when he fed the five thousands, or the seven thousand, or when he was here and there? When was it? In Gethsemane, on his way to Golgotha, on his way to die. When will you say, not my, but thy will be done? 
when you are ready to die with him and to live with him. Also here we must see where what was said and in which context the bitter cup was handed to him and he said, Lord, O Father, if it is possible, then let this cup pass by me. And then he says, No, right for this purpose I came into this hour. Also we would sometimes say, Father, let this bitter cup pass by me. And when we then become quiet, then it speaks in us, God has led us right into this hour, so that our way ends, that our will stops, and the will of God takes place, and that we can walk on the way of God. Everything at its place, at its time. How is it with you, with all of us? Could you say it already with all your heart? O oh God, I want to do thy will. Do you know that this is the be all and end all? Because what is written in Samuel, disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry. And here somebody may say, idolatry, I idolatry. I'm not a pagan. The idolatry here can be worse than the one there. Every self-will, every stubbornness of the heart, every own way, and everything what we make of ourselves is an abomination to God. We must become a part of that, what God is doing now. And He has, at the beginning of this year, He lets us hear such a sermon and let us not marvel why it had to come over us like a thunderstorm. Don't you know that a good thunderstorm cleanses the air? This is just necessary. And I hope that we also see here the connections. The Spirit of God leads to repentance, to remorse, to a turnaround. The Spirit of God convicts of sin because we did not believe in Him. As the Scripture says, the same Spirit of God then continues to convict that God's righteousness was returned unto us. And then I tell you what happens. Roughly, I can describe you a conversion. Firstly, the Spirit of God comes upon the person, convicts him of his wickedness, of his badness, and whatever is there, that you get disgusted with yourself. If I bring the words over my lips here, which I have sometimes given myself as a title in the hour of self-examination and repentance, then you would all leave this building. But a person who comes into the presence of God, he's done. He's done. He can't anymore. What did the prophet Isaiah say? when he was in God's sanctuary. I am a man 
of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. It was over for him. O oh God, put us into your presence, that we see who we are, to see who you are, and what you made out of us. Secondly, when we go through this first process, and to put it again onto a scriptural foundation, I read you Romans 7. Don't you think that the servants of God walked over this earth as sanctimonious people, as if they would hover over all things? Paul, in Romans 7, he made a plea of being guilty, which every person that becomes a believer must also give. There is no way around it. Perhaps I shall read it here, so that you know that the thunderstorm does not come here from the platform, but from God, through His Word, and that it was worked through His Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 7, you can read much. I read from verse 16, hmm, maybe already from verse 15. For I don't understand what I am doing. Who of you said this already? Who of you has said that before? Very few. But today we will all say it. When the Spirit of God comes upon a person, then you are stripped. Then there's nothing fiddled or touched up. Then you are as you are before the Lord, and not on the stage, but in the audience. Here we read, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that I do. Who can say this? Was it with you like this? Doesn't have to be always and every day, but most certainly this is all our testimony. Verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. We could go here deep into details. God has in his omniscience man who fell. He had to catch him, convict him, and he has given the law to show him where his transgressions are. And therefore Paul writes here, what I want to do, one moment, verse 16 again, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Who of you has ever been so honest? As it is being said here in the Holy Bible, this is so. God's word is true in all things. We read on, For the good that I would I do not, 
but the evil which I would not, that I do. A man of God, an apostle, a man who was raptured into the third heaven, he heard words which he could not utter. A man who could say, the mystery that was hidden to the children of men from the time when the world began is now revealed to his holy servants and apostles. Here he pours out his heart. And I tell you why there is such a manifoldness in the New Testament. So that every individual and the church and every situation into which we could come was described so that we receive from the Holy Scripture the divine answer. Therefore, all these things happened. I read on. Verse 20, may God help us. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It continues in verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And then comes the great cry. Here Paul does not describe his situation at that time. He summarizes everything what belongs to a biblical conversion. And then he cries out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Didn't he know about redemption? Oh yes. But he describes here your and my development, your and my situation, your and my battle. How many has this happened to? That they sometimes were ashamed not only before God, but also before men and that they were glad that nobody has seen and heard it. And what do we say then? These words I don't want to say here. Let us stay with this desperate cry. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Did he want to put an end to this? No, this is not the end. This is the end of remorse, of repentance, of the inner turnaround. Everything is put upside down. And you cry, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall redeem me from the body of this death? You all know how Brother Brennan calls the body a pest house, a thing that stings miles afar. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Dear heart, if you listened until now, then also hear now what is written here. 
I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It took place. He described inwardly by the Spirit of God the whole development of a true conversion up to the point, O oh, wretched man that I am, I am sold out to sin. All is in vain. All my efforts stranded. I can't anymore. And then comes the cry, Thanks be to God. It is finished through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Praise be to the living God. I know that God can bring the hammer down. But then when the wounds have been inflicted, then comes the balm on the wounds and he heals. That's how it is written. You smite and you heal again. But he can only heal those who are of a contrite heart because there dwells God in the sanctuary and with them who are of a contrite heart and of a humble spirit. When you see something walking upright, having his nose up, you can forget him. A pardoned person will know who pardoned him. I have to come to a close because the earthly strength is also not available to me indefinitely, although with God's help, yes. Let me now open up the next chapter. The one chapter. This we all went through now. I tremble in my whole body now. This we all went through. And whoever was not grabbed yet, let him ask God that he is seized. The gospel penetrates our soul. And we ask, what must I do? The condition of a person, as God sees him and as he really is, this we have here in Romans 7 extensively described. Up to the point, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I like to do good with all my heart. I agree with God and His Word. And always notice, I come too short, I come too short. And there are some who then almost want to give up. Before I read from chapter 8, let me quote to you the word from 1 John. We have an advocate with the Father. No man who was pardoned needs to despair. No one who has put his hope in God through Jesus Christ our Lord needs to despair. And no one who has fallen needs to remain lying. Arise in the name of the Lord and walk forward with your God. Romans chapter 8 A difference like day and night. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! Through all the desperation, pangs of conscience, through the inner battle, and then coming to the victory in Christ. 
no condemnation anymore. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Praise God. If this is not the gospel, then I don't know what the gospel is. And if we ever could experience God, then it's today. Today. What did we say yesterday or a day before yesterday? There are times when the time is at hand and comes nearer and nearer. And suddenly, the time is not only at hand, suddenly, the time is here. The hour of God is here, that we all go through a biblical conversion until we experience God after the pattern of the early church. And where no one needs to ask the other anymore, do you think that I am converted? This really exists? Whoever still needs to ask whether he is converted, he is most probably not converted. Whoever still has to ask whether he is born again, is most probably not born again. I say this on purpose, not loud. Such strong admonitions are suited best when they are brought in love, but in seriousness. May God, on this first day of the year 88, lay a biblical foundation in your and in my life, a biblical remorse and repentance, a conversion, a new birth, even of giving a baptism in the Holy Spirit, where no more we have to help, but where a rushing mighty wind comes from heaven, and where the Lord manifests himself among his own. John sent those people back who were not ready at all to repent. He says, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, who told you that you can escape the coming wrath? Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. And as we read, our Savior acted upon the ministry of John the Baptist, and then he described it in a few sentences, very appropriate. I read it again in closing. Luke 7, verse 29 and 30. And all the people that heard him, even the publicans, obeyed the will of God. And you can read it. John preached the will of God. He said to the people, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He not only baptized, he preached the kingdom of God and everything what belonged to it. And those who accepted it were baptized. And then it says, as emphasized earlier in verse 30, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of Him. It was not befitting them. It was not according to their knowledge, not according to their teaching. They were not ready to submit to the will of God. 
they did not recognize the day of God's gracious visitation. On the contrary, they did all kinds of things to cause damage to the matter of God. Beloved, did we recognize the time of God's gracious visitation that all things now have to be restored and to it belongs also the biblical baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and this on them who really heard the gospel who were convicted by the Spirit of God of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. If you did not understand this, how the divine justification took place, how can you have it then? We have to know these things and experience them. Not only knowing, we must experience them. And may the Almighty God, who surprised me, and I think all of us, today He surprised us so graciously and visited us. May He bless us. May He give grace that His word, which we heard, that it accomplishes in all of us for what He has sent it for. And I give you all the one advice. Leave all the speaking with one another. Only that what is necessary and not in hypocrisy. I don't mean that. Not that somebody looks into the other direction when he sees someone. I don't mean that. But I mean conversations that are unnecessary. Let us leave them so that the Spirit of God can work after the sermon. You all know when one takes a medicine, sometimes it takes two or three hours. Then comes the effect. I believe the impact of the revelation that we have heard here today and as we were told, we will all feel it. I am grateful to God with all my heart. You also? Are you really grateful to God? Amen. Amen. Is there no resistance in you? Amen. Do you all want to experience God? Amen. Amen. Let us stand up. Who is not ashamed to say what Paul has said in Romans chapter 7? Say Amen. That's how we are in the eyes of God. He judged our condition correctly. But he says through the prophet Isaiah, even your sins would be red as scarlet, they shall become whiter than the snow. May the Spirit of God convict now of sin, of unbelief, and then of righteousness which God gave us, and also because the prince of this world is judged. Who believes that we, by the grace of God, were transferred from Romans 7 into Romans 8? Amen. Amen. Who is ready to say with all his heart, Thy will be done? Amen. Wholeheartedly. Thy will be done. Who wants to say with all his heart, Thy kingdom come? Amen. Heavenly Father, you see us all. Continue to work through your word.
and through your spirit in your blood-bought multitude. Beloved Lord, I pray for all and I stand now on your word from John 17. I not only pray for you but also for all who through your word will come to believe in me. You prayed for all, also for us, for me, for all who would ever believe. For them you prayed. Faithful Lord, we thank you for it. You have us, wretched people, in whom there is nothing good, who were heading for death and perdition. For them you had mercy. You have held the mirror of your word before our eyes and we have known us. The poison of the serpent had the impact on us, but you crushed the head of the serpent. And as Moses lifted up the serpent, and all who looked at it, they lived. So you, as the Lamb of God, on the cross, you were lifted up. We look up to you, who you crushed the head of the serpent, and the poison of sin, the sting of death, you pulled it out. You have judged the prince of this world. You said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Hallelujah! Oh my God, thanks be to you for the victory of Calvary. Satan is defeated. Hell is conquered. Death defeated. The sin is forgiven. Hallelujah! Lord, you brought new life to light by the resurrection from the dead. O oh God, you have done so good unto us today. Hallelujah! 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 Praise God! Praise God! You have done so good unto us today. You showed us that we have to be crucified with you. You pronounced us guilty and then you acquitted us. O oh God, only those who know that they have been found guilty and have been sentenced lawfully can be pardoned. Only those who recognize themselves as lost can be saved. Lord, let the original proclamation return into the church. My God, I ask you, equip brothers as evangelists with fire and spirit. O oh, Savior, to you be the praise and honor, Lord. Let us forget what the world says or thinks about it. We stand before you. And the only question which we have is, how do I stand before you? Faithful God, come down to us. Turn your face toward us. Bless, Lord, thine inheritance. Hallelujah. 
O God, O God, lift ye up all your voices and thank the living God. Hallelujah. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 I stepped already aside and suddenly a word of the Lord came to me and I would like to read these scriptures by faith trusting that God gives us a year of a gracious visitation as we have not seen and experienced it before. You all know from the Old Testament of the year of Jubilee when 49 years have passed, 7 times 7, then came the 50th year, and this was a year of Jubilee. Our Lord read this word in Luke 4, but firstly I read it from Isaiah 61. And I ask you all, be prepared to experience what was foretold and promised. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek did we hear it? For he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And now it comes to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I read you this scripture which my Lord has read from the New Testament. Luke chapter 4 from verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then it says, after he read this, he closed the book. More we don't need to read today. Let us believe with all our heart that this year will be such a year of jubilee, a year of jubilee in which all can go out free Every bond, every enslavement, everything what still may be there, that we by faith can proclaim this year and experience it, 
that the captives are set free. Those who are bound are loosed. Can you believe it? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. I say, he opened the book at the right place. Amen. Amen. And he also stopped at the right word. He only spoke of the year of salvation, not of the day of vengeance. This is our Lord and our God. He is faithful. I know today are great things happening in our midst. Today great things are happening in our hearts. We will no longer be the same after this day. God has given it to him. Be the thanks for it. Hallelujah. Praise God.